We have been the last few weeks, we've been going through a um, kind of a run-up, I suppose. It's a long run-up, but that's me. What can I tell you? But a run-up to a contemplative practice, and that's kind of at the, at the end of this road we're on, trying to more closely define what it is that we're doing as followers of Jesus. Because our church has veered off from the contemplative and mystical tradition that uh, Jesus is a part of in the first century and, and through which he's teaching his people, that we can be face-to-face -face with God in the sense of our presence. And unless and until we are connected with God in that deeply personal way, we're not understanding the truth. And so we, we can't find the freedom from our fears. And so letting go of a lot of our sacred cows, letting go of a lot of the things that we have come to believe and have clutched onto for millennia as a church and for decades probably as individuals is a part of the process of coming up to a sincere, intentional, and dedicated contemplative practice that will really take us the rest of the way. Everything that we do in terms of, dis of deconstruction intellectual deconstruction, trying to understand Jesus from a different point of view, from a first century Hebrew point of view, it's only showing us the door. We have to walk through the door, and we walk through it contemplatively. And so that's what we've been trying to do. And then I got asked a question uh, last week, and I thought this would be a good thing, a another little step to take in terms of understanding why we do what we do here at The Effect, and how it affects our ability to take this contemplative leap. I get asked questions from time to time. I would encourage questions, even ones that are a little challengey, shall we say. You know, I love those. Uh, I love the fact that people are thinking and saying, yeah, why? Now, many of you have come from evangelical churches, more orthodox and, um, and traditional, conservative evangelical churches. And one of the things that you might have been wondering is the question that I got. Why don't we do altar calls? Now, how many of you don't know what an altar call is? Good, just a, just a couple people. Well, an altar call is a, is a feature of evangelical churches. Essentially, it is a conversion ritual, if you will. It is the asking from the pulpit or asking from the stage that if anybody wants to come to know Jesus Christ, please come up. And what typically will happen in that encounter will be the saying of the sinner's prayer. And the sinner's prayer is just a short prayer that's got four basic parts to it. And the first part is to acknowledge that we are a sinner and to ask for forgiveness. The second is to make a quick statement of uh, orthodox belief. You know, basically that Christ has died for our sins and that he rose again. And the third part would be to give an intention of our repentance, that we want to take a different path. We want to go in a different direction. And then finally, to call on and accept Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. So the four parts of the sinner's prayer would incorporate that. And just as I have said it, you can see it's a beautiful first step, isn't it? A beautiful first step toward the admission, first of all, of our dependence, on God, our reliance on God. It's a statement of our humility that we are starting to finally see the type of relationship that we have with God and by extension with each other. And it's an intention of change, an intention of moving in a new direction. Now, the problem that we have seen with it only is that culturally within the church, it is seen as the only step. It is seen as an end in itself. So I remember when, uh, especially when we first started working uh, in recovery and we were working through the 12 steps, I would get a lot of pushback from conservative Christians on the 12 steps themselves. You don't need 12 steps. It's just one step, you know? Just accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior and you don't need any of the other steps. And of course, we knew that that wasn't going to work in terms of recovery, that there is a process to this. It's something that needs to happen over time. But there's this sort of idea that if we can get someone to say the sinner's prayer, then we can kind of notch our belt because that person is now saved. You know, as if the saying of the prayer itself is what triggered the salvation mechanism, triggered God's acceptance of us in some way. 
Now, there are seven sacraments that are usually recognized by the church. You're gonna, I'm going to be going back to my Catholic roots here for a bit. You know, can you name the seven sacraments? <laughs> well, of course, they include baptism and confirmation and the Eucharist and reconciliation, which we knew as confession. And then, of course, there's marriage and holy orders, which would be ordination. And then, of course, either anointing of the sick, last rites, extreme unction, whatever you want to call it. So those would be the seven sacraments that are usually recognized by the church. Now, we, every time we do a sacrament in here, whether it's ordination, whether it's marriage, yeah, usually not marriage so much, but baptism certainly, we try to remind people that what a sacrament is is an outward expression of an inward transformation. Outward expression of an inward transformation. The ritual in and of itself is meaningless. It's just a ritual. It's just a shell. What we bring to it is what matters. It's the meaning in the heart that performs the sacrament that makes all the difference. Because without a pure or intentional or transformative heart, there is no meaning in the ritual, in the sacrament itself. Now, I don't know if that seems too harsh to you. Let's see what Jesus says. See if I can get any support from him. If you take a look at Matthew 5, right at verse 23. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, okay, there's the sacrament, the sacrifice, the presenting of the altar. In the purity codes of the Jews of the time, if you had any infraction of the law, if you had become unclean in any way, you needed to go to the temple, you needed to see the priest, you needed to perform some sort of sacrifice, whatever you could afford, and then to be declared clean by the priest before you could move back into community life. So this is what Jesus is talking about. And of course, everybody understands that. The law was ingrained in them fully. So if you're presenting your offering at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother. Then come and present your offering. I mean, Jesus is saying exactly the same here, thing here. The ritual itself, the sacrifice itself, the offering itself means nothing without the relationship to back it up, without the sense of forgiveness for another that may be damaging a relationship, and without the sense of community. The ritual itself comes from that connection point comes from that willingness to be that present, to be that connected. The ritual itself doesn't do that for us. The ritual itself is the outward expression of an inward transformation. Take a look at Mark 12, starting at verse 28. Then one of the scribes came near and heard them arguing with one another. So they were debating in the temple courtyard. He saw how well Jesus answered them, so he asked Jesus, which commandment is the most important of them all? And Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And the second is this, you must love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. And then the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher. You have told the truth that God is one and there is no other besides him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw how wisely the man answered, he told him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. This is one of those rare times where Jesus gets to praise a scribe. <laughs> Count them. They're going to they're gonna be on one hand, basically, in the New Testament. But here he sees this man is understanding this basic principle. More than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices, it's the principle of love that dominates. It's the principle of love that is everything to this relationship that we have with our God. And to the extent that these rituals are driving us into the love connection to understand more deeply, to have more presence to each other and to God's spirit, great. 
in and of themselves, it doesn't matter. One of my favorite passages is in Micah, one of the Old Testament prophets at Micah 6. And starting at verse 6, listen to how he puts an even finer point on it. He says, With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams, in 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? That's it. 10,000 rams, 10,000 rivers of oil doesn't matter to God if we're not practicing consciously justice, kindness, humility. If that hasn't transformed us, what does the rest matter? What did Paul talk about? The clanging gong, gong, the noisy symbol. If I have that love, what's the rest of it all mean? Same idea here. It's all about a transformed heart. Not following laws, not following codes, customs, rituals, mitzvah, good deeds, the code of righteousness. Even those, yeah, they're going to have an effect on the people to whom you do the good deed. But as far as you are concerned, as far as your spiritual growth and formation, as far as your ability to have God say, I do know you, I see you, we are connected because you are present to me. None of that matters. And as I said before, to the extent that the laws and the rituals help us along that journey, help us to let go of the things that distract us, help us to see clearly the unseen on top of the seen world that we live. That's why we have them. Religion done well is funneling us toward a deeper experience of God. What Marion was talking about, that we need that deeper experience. If everything that we're doing here in this faith community, if everything that Christianity does as a whole is funneling us toward that connection point, toward that kind of presence, then it's perfect. That's what religion is supposed to do. Religio, reconnect us. But it's not an end in itself. The rituals are not ends in themselves. They are meaningless except for what we bring to them. To be completely truthful with you, we don't need sacraments. We don't need rituals at all to come to God, to come into what Jesus calls kingdom. But we do need community. We absolutely need community. Why? Because love requires a beloved. Yeah? Who are you going to love? Love requires a beloved. Living out love in community, in our families, is what this is all about. We do this in community together. And in community and for community, sacraments and rituals become important again in a different way. They're necessary as rites of passage as ways for us to be able to move through the milestones and the different phases of our spiritual formation, of our walk, if you will, and be celebrated by and recognized by the community at the same time. These rites of passage are what bond the community together. It's a shared experience that we have. When we have a baptism here, we're sharing that experience. The person who's having it and everyone who is celebrating around them, everyone who is praying over them and encouraging them, it's a beautiful thing to see when it happens. That shared experience creates a shared belonging, a sense of belonging, that we really do have a seat at the table, that we are one in this community. We've lost the sense in our culture today for the need for sacraments, for the need for rites of passage. They're no longer practiced in our community around us. Not just the community, but our nation. And pretty much the Western world has moved away as we become more and more intellectual, as we become more and more technical, as we become more and more scientific, 
And we've left the quote unquote mythic world. We've left the mystical world. We left this, this deep sense of connection. The rites of passage have gone with it. We don't have these rituals that will help us to both bond our communities and also to mark the passage as we are moving through so that we know where we are in the shape of the journey. And we don't even know what we're missing anymore because it's been so long since we've had these in our own experience as an individual. But we do know something's wrong, don't we? I mean, I hear it over and over again. What's wrong with the world? Where's the world going? Where's our country? I don't recognize it anymore. I hear these things so often. The shared experiences as a people, as a nation, as a group, the shared experiences, that sense of beliefs and shared beliefs and shared values are what bind us together. And the rituals and the sacraments and the rites of passage along the way are what we do to celebrate these shared beliefs, and to recognize our passage. You know, the United States used to be described, maybe it still is at times, as a melting pot. It's a country of immigrants, as, as we've said, and immigrants, I mean, the, the whole nation was populated by immigrants on top of the Native Americans, of course. But if it ever was a melting pot, right now it seems like it's become more of a mosaic when you look at it. Rather than immigrants coming in and assimilating in and finding a shared system of belief, to find shared iconography, to find shared rituals that bind us together, each group seems to be holding on more deeply to its own ethnic identity. And more and more people are, are becoming unwilling to even identify as American. They identify with their own ethnicity first, their own culture first. And now it's beautiful, don't get me wrong, it's beautiful to hold on to your ethnic language and your customs and your culture. That's part of the strength of our nation to have that. And how boring would it be if we didn't have these different ethnicities to explore and enjoy, if we couldn't go get Chinese food? How bad would that be? So I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but how then also do we bind ourselves together as a nation? How do we feel like we are one people in the midst of the diversity? How do we do that as a country? Often I hear the U.S. being compared unfavorably to other countries around the world, and one of them that comes up a lot is Sweden. You know, couldn't we just be more like Sweden? Look what Sweden has. You know, they got clean streets, they got socialized medicine, they got these things, and they want to compare these things. But we forget a few things, right? You know what the population of Sweden is? It's just over 10 million. Do you know what the population of Los Angeles is? 12 and a half million. Los Angeles has far more people than the whole country of Sweden, and the Swedes are 80% Swedish. <laughs> They share a common heritage. They share a common culture. They share a language. They share these markers that are so diverse in our country. And just the sheer size alone makes it impossible for us to be able to do what a country like Sweden does. But we got to do something. How do we bond ourselves? How do we find these shared rituals, these shared rites of passage that can actually bind us back together again? And there's another problem, too. When we talk about a rite of passage today, we might talk about a baby losing its first tooth. We might talk about a child going into high school or graduating high school as a rite of passage. But a true rite of passage, a classic rite of passage, has three parts. And those three parts are essential if you're really going to have the experience that a rite of passage is supposed to bring us. And those three parts are separation, transition, and reincorporation. So if you think of classic rite of passages, maybe in the Aborigines in Australia, and it's usually with the young boys, because the girls have built-in rites of passage. You know, they have childbearing. And most, in most Aboriginal cultures and ancient cultures, it was the girl that left her home and went to the home of the groom, and the boy stayed home. So you only gained daughters-in-law. You never lost sons in those cultures. And so those were built-in rite of passage for the girls. 
But the boys didn't have those. That's why the rituals were focused on the young men, the boys, because they had no way to mark their movement from one stage of life to another. And so when a boy was old enough, he would be taken away from the village, taken away from the company of the women and the children, and taken out into the wild, into the bush. And there was usually some kind of ceremony there, which involved cutting or tattooing or some kind of pain. So the separation to be taken away from the familiar life that you know, and then to be moved into a transition. After the ceremony, the boy, at least in the case of the Aborigines, would be told to go walk about, which could last six months or more. And the boy had to survive in the wild by himself, learning and applying what he had learned all his life through the chanting of the song lines that described the land and described the watering holes and described all the landmarks that he would need to navigate and which plants could heal him and which plants would be poisonous and how he could hunt. All of that was ingrained into him at the tender age of 12 or 13. And if he successfully completed the transition, if he successfully completed the walkabout and came back alive, then he was welcomed back into the community, reincorporated back into the community. But now everyone recognized this is a man in the community who can take his place in the tribe. That is a rite of passage. And it has to have those three parts, separation, transition, reincorporation. Where are those in our culture? Where do you see that shape of a journey in our culture? You know, the nearest I can think about is military service. A person, a recruit, comes into the, uh, the military, whatever branch it happens to be, and the first thing they do is strip them of everything that describes their own identity. They cut off their hair, they take their clothes, they take everything, and they replace it with the identity of the soldier, someone who has to learn to obey orders without a, without a second thought, someone who can give their lives for the sake of the one who's standing next to them, a different type of experience. And if that person is then deployed overseas, well, there's a whole another, right? Separation, transition. Now, what we do terribly with our military is reincorporate them, don't, they? don't we? We don't reincorporate them well. That's why the suicide rate is through the roof with our returning veterans. The only other thing that I can think about, maybe, is uh, the recovery process. Someone who leaves their state, goes to another state, goes into recovery, there's separation, there's transition, something that they need to do in order to be able to get to the place where they can reincorporate back into their home, back into their families. There is a rite of passage, and there are others, but notice they are not universally experienced by everyone in our nation, in our communities. They are separate, carved out experiences. But what is it that really connects us all in the way that we're talking about with a universal rite of passage or rites of passage, rituals, sacraments that bring us together? And even within the church, our sacraments no longer really contain the full rite of passage as I've just described it to you. Baptism used to. If you were baptized, baptized, if you were Baptist, if you were baptized in the first century, all right, you would have to go through a lengthy process of discipleship to become an actual Talmudi, akin to that, that military process we just talked about, where the, the, the person who is entering the faith would let go of everything that was theirs, kind of like dropping your nets and following Jesus, to be re-imprinted by the teacher with the new ways of the community, the new ways of life that Jesus has described as kingdom, completely inculcated into the faith before they would actually be baptized. Marriage used to be more of a rite of passage. It used to be that marriage came at the end of a long and formal courtship process. I mean, very, very formal, the way that you move from stage to stage toward intimacy with your betrothed. And the families would have a chance to bond together. Now people just go to Vegas. <laughs> and more attention is paid at preparing the party than preparing for marriage itself. And so the wedding is no longer the end and the reincorporation of a process of separation and transition. So it's, we're, we're losing the whole sense of what these used to be. 
getting back to the original question that we were asked, that I was asked, you know, why don't we do altar calls? Now, we will say the sinner's prayer with anybody who wants to say the sinner's prayer. It's not that we're opposed to it at all. But we do that more privately. The times that I have led someone in a prayer like the sinner's prayer, a prayer of an intentional coming to a new place, of connecting with God and Jesus in a new way, it was exactly that. It was a private expression of the person's intention to embark on a new journey. Absolutely essential as a starting point, but only as a starting point, only as that first step. It's as important as a first step of AA to admit that you're powerless over alcohol, that your life has become unmanageable, to admit that you are a sinner. You have these compulsions. You have these obsessions. You can't, on your own steam, be able to get for where you need to go, that you are reliant not only on God but on the community around you as well, and that you have this intention, you have this desire to get the help that you need, to do what you need to do, to change your lifestyle in order to be able to move in this direction. So we use baptism as our communal ritual, as our celebration that we have, rather than the altar call or the sinner's prayer at the effect. Because again, it's an outward expression of an inward transformation. And when we have seen somebody in our community for some time, long enough that we've been able to have the time to view them in community, to know that they've done the work that needs to be done to make the transition that they're making, just as Jesus had to, just as Paul, Abraham, Moses, Noah, Jonah, every hero of faith has the same shape to his or her journey, that going out into the wilderness to let go of the familiar world. Think of Jesus leaving his family, leaving the, the family business, going out into the wilderness, separation, transition, and then reincorporation when he comes back, a changed person. They don't even recognize him anymore because he's changed so much as he starts his ministry. And I want you to think about your own journey. Most of you who came here came from other churches that you needed to separate from, painfully so, in many of your cases, because they were no longer describing the journey that you thought you were on. They no longer described even the values that you were trying to espouse. And so many of you had already undergone your separation by the time you came here to the effect. It was the reason that you did come here to the effect. And you continued your transition. You continued your journey. And we've watched you be able to do that. But so many of the people who have come here did come from other churches. They've already been baptized. And so they didn't feel the need to be baptized again. They'd already done that. But they did feel the need to continue more deeply on this path and to understand what that path was all about. There was many who thought that they would never set foot in a church again. And yet they found something here that allowed them to be able to fold back into community, to reincorporate again after they had taken their journey. That is the experience that we've had. And baptism for us is a more complete expression of an inward transformation that can be then expressed outwardly and celebrated and connected with the rest of the community. Altar calls, the sinner's prayer, not in the Bible at all. Not one of those seven sacraments that we talked about before. Now, that's not a reason to not do it, of course. I'm not saying that. But it is a question of emphasis. We don't ever want to imply that this ritual or any ritual equals salvation, quote unquote, especially as we understand salvation. If simply saying the sinner's prayer or any prayer that, are, that is made of words triggered God's acceptance of us, caused him to give us something that was previously been withheld, Marcus Borg had a great line for that. He said, it's salvation by syllables. I want you to think about that for a second. Salvation by syllables. If that's all it took, just saying a string of words in the right order, and suddenly the heavens opened up and God is accepting of us, there's a word for that, and the word is superstitious. That is a superstition. 
And if you're not sure what a superstition is, it's supernatural cause and effect. That these two things are linked that have no linkage whatever. If I carry this rabbit's foot, I will have good luck. That's superstition because there is no cause and effect to that. If I say this prayer, if I tithe, then God will make sure my mortgage gets paid. Superstitious. We don't ever want to devolve into that. We want to take seriously what it is we're doing here and what it is that we're connecting with God and the, and the relationship and the means by which we're connecting with God. Jesus is not superstitious. Jesus practiced all the rituals of Judaism, every single one of them, to his dying day. But he always kept them in their proper place. He was always teaching what was foremost in a person's life. As we already read in the passages before, Jesus knows that just to obey law, to obey traditions and purity rituals and codes of righteousness doesn't magically gain God's favor. How could it? We already have that. We already have God's favor. He is withholding nothing from us. I know that's not our experience day by day, but it's the truth that Jesus was trying to get across to us, and it was so important, he called it the good news. It's in this engaging of a radically different way of living, a radically different way of experiencing life, that our salvation is realized. And we realize that God's salvation, God's acceptance and love and connection of us is not withheld until we perform something like a ritual or a good deed or anything. The realization is that it was always there to begin with, and it can't be any other way because God is love, and God is this degreeless love that we've been talking about. And we always have that. God's love is like our ruby slippers. They'll take us home anytime we want once we understand the good news that Jesus is trying to get across to us. And we also have to understand that this salvation is not acceptance into heaven and avoidance of hell in the next life as we've so often thought of it, or pretty much universally think of it now. But to a Jew, it was spiritual liberation, spiritual freedom right here and right now, the state and the quality of life that Jesus called kingdom. And to get there, it's a breaking with the familiar worldview that limits us, that sees things in terms of performance, sees things in terms of some sort of contractual relationship. It's a breaking with familiar beliefs. That's the separation part that we've been talking about. It's Jesus saying, if you want to follow me, sell everything that you have. There's the separation. And then engage a journey of gradual and eternal becoming closer and closer to God, closer and closer to each other, more and more able to be present completely in a moment without the emotional and intellectual triggers that would take us out and drop us back into our obsessive and compulsive patterns. That's the transition part, the second part of the rite of passage that will eventually make us aware of the salvation. Again, let's take a look at what Jesus would say, starting at John 8, starting at verse 31. Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, who had become, got to the place where they were trusting him, this is who he's talking to, and he says, if you continue, if you continue in my word, and melta, the word there is not just a word, it's, it's huge, it's much larger than that. It's a worldview, it's a way of seeing life much larger than just a word or a commandment. Sometimes we translate this commandment. Not a good translation for this understanding. If you continue in my way of seeing life, way of living life, way of loving in life, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. This is the continuation. This is the continual process of staying in this place, continuing to live life this way, even when it's presenting so traumatically, even when the people in front of you are so unlovely, but that you can still live these principles of love. The freedom of this truth, of this love and connection, is the salvation that we seek. It is this liberation that we will then carry into the next life. 
What Jesus and the Jews are telling us is salvation doesn't start at death. We carry it into whatever follows death. At John 13, starting at verse 34, a new commandment I give you, and I've already told you I don't really like that translation, but a new commandment I give you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. Love one another even as I have loved you. That you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Not a particular theology, not an orthodox way of thinking, not a particular ritual or doctrine, but how you relate to each other in community tells the tale of who you are and who you are in me if you are in me. Next chapter, John 14, starting at verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments again. In other words, you will continue in the way of living that I am showing you and teaching you. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You will live also. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, continues in them, is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and disclose myself to him. A continual becoming. It's hard to imagine more beautiful and hopeful words than this. The unity is already there. Jesus and the Father are one. The Father is one with everything. There is only one Lord. We are part of that oneness as well. But until we understand enough to be able to take the steps to experience it, to realize it in our lives, it will have no effect on us. It will give us nothing in terms of the knowledge that we need, the knowing that we need, the real experience of it. This continual becoming of oneness and unity. This is what Jesus is trying to get across to us. This is the difference between mere following ritual and practice and actually transforming from the inside out. Now, we have reduced the concept of salvation to mere acceptance of heaven and avoidance of hell. And on top of that, we've reduced obtaining salvation to a single event, a specific act or a specific ritual that triggers this acceptance of God which is superstitious. What we need to do and what we've been trying to do in here is to restore the fullness of Jesus' way, what it actually means as a true rite of passage, as a true way forward to sell everything and to follow a radically different way of living that will take us far and wide, take us on a journey and change everything in the process so that when we come back full circle, right, we have something of value for our community and, of course, for ourselves in the new way that we perceive life, in the new way that we experience our moments. And that's what we want to offer here at The Effect. We want to offer the map of the journey. We want to offer permission that you can take this journey, even if it's sanding lumber against the grain as you see it, even if others aren't going to approve of you moving in a different direction, that you have the permission to do so, that you have the tools, that you have the encouragement, and of course you have the partnership all along the way, that you're not alone in trying to do this, that someone is always by your side. But in this, we will never tell you what to do. We're not gonna tell you what you need to think or what you need to believe. That is up to you, because Jesus didn't do that either. Go back and read the red type. He doesn't coerce anyone. He doesn't force himself on anyone. He simply invites, and he models, and he shows. Now, we'll tell you what we're convinced of, 
but you need to go become convinced of what you're convinced of. We hope that you will see the transformation in our own lives, and if you don't, we'll stop listening, all right? But we hope that you'll see that. We'll hope that you see something attractive, something that you would want, so that you stay in community with us. And we always stand ready to help anyone. If you want to say the sinner's prayer, come tell us. We can do that. If you want baptism, tell us. We'll certainly do that. Whatever you need to be able to be moved along this journey, this rite of passage that's taking you closer and closer to connection with God, we want to be there to help you with those things. And meantime, as we're going through this, we just want to enjoy your company. We want to have a good time. We want to laugh like we did this morning because we just love having you with us. This is an end in itself in terms of the community, if not the rituals that we practice within our community. But tell us what you need. And if you don't know what you need, then tell us that too. And we'll figure it out together because that's what friends do. Let's pray. Father, you've given us everything. You've withheld nothing. And yet it's so easy for us to not see that or to forget and to keep asking for things that have already been given, to keep waiting for things to arrive that are already here in our midst. Help us to see more clearly the journey that we need to make and if we feel stalled out, if we feel a grayness around us that we're not moving forward, that we don't have the kind of relationships that we would like with you, with each other, that we would take it upon ourselves to connect with whoever has their hand out, to walk together into a deeper place, and to never stop realizing that you are inexhaustible, that we can always turn a corner and see a new vista, that we will leave no stone unturned in wanting this for ourselves and for the sake of our relationships and our families and everyone that we encounter along the way. Stoke that desire in us, Father. Help us to ask the pertinent questions and just ask for help to lay down the pride that we would like to have that illusion of ourselves that is completely self-sufficient and just realize, no, we need help like everyone else and to find it. And help all of us to be attentive to the needs of others who are just in our community and may need our care. So Father, thank you again for everything that you shower upon us every single moment of every single day. Never let us forget, we can only love because you loved us first. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.